Good afternoon. Today I'm joined by uh, Minister Hienare, who will speak about our Māori vaccination campaign, and Dr Bloomfield, who set out decisions on booster shots for immunocompromised New Zealanders. But first, I am going to hand over to Dr Bloomfield, who will talk about cases today. Thank you, Prime Minister, and uh, kia ora koutou katoa. So today we're reporting 94 new cases in the community. 87 of these are in Auckland and seven are in the Waikato. The new cases take our total in this outbreak to 2,099, uh, and of those, 1,384 have recovered now. Of today's cases, 53 are yet to be linked to a current case, but interviews are underway. What I would say is that all seven of the cases in the Waikato uh, have already been linked to existing cases. Of yesterday's 60 cases, 19 of those remain unlinked and pr at present with investigations ongoing. Today there are 38 people in hospital with COVID-19 and all of those are in the Auckland region. Uh, five are in either ICU or a high dependency unit. Uh, yesterday there were 12,688 swabs taken across Auckland, maintaining the high level of uh, testing there, which is important and necessary. And there were 16,921 tests taken or processed around the country. Testing continues right across Auckland today with 19 uh, centres in uh, operation, including 13 pop-up centres. As I said, the seven cases in the Waikato today uh, have all been linked, and so now only two cases from the total number in the Waikato are as yet unlinked uh, from last week, and two cases uh, reported on Sunday. Investigations continue on. There is region-wide testing continuing across Waikato, and that is very important while it remains in Alert Level 3 to help inform uh, our advice and the decisions later in the week about the ongoing status of the Waikato. Testing uh, is available across Waikato. Please do look on the Health Point website or the Waikato DHB website. And for anyone in Waikato, and indeed anywhere across the motu, if you have not been vaccinated yet, today is the day to do it. Please check on Book My Vaccine as to where you can get yours done. So on to vaccination, uh, the COVID-19 Technical Advisory Group has recommended that individuals aged 12 and older with severe immunocompromise receive a third primary dose of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. It's important to note this third primary dose is different to a booster dose in the general population. Severely immunocompromised people are at higher risk of severe outcomes for COVID-19 and because of their um, immunocompromise may not produce a sufficiently strong immune response to just two doses of the vaccine. So a third primary dose can be of benefit in this group and that is in includes those who are taking immunosuppressive therapies, for example if they've had a transplant, uh, before or after their first or second dose of the vaccine as well as some individuals with chronic diseases. The Technical Advisory Group will continue to review the emerging evidence for uh, a booster dose, and once we have received additional, uh, an application from Pfizer and advice from the Technical Advisory Group, as well as a decision by Cabinet, uh, we will um, prov be providing further advice around uh, the progress with booster doses and we will have an update next week on where the current status is around wider booster doses. In terms of the outbreak in Auckland, Auckland Regional Public Health Service is now supporting 84 of the cases there across 55 households to safely isolate at home. Now this is part of an interim approach where we finalise plans involving primary care, including GP clinics and others, as well as community providers to support people to isolate safely at home. Criteria for isolating at home are based on both a public health and a clinical risk assessment and take into consideration factors such as a person, whether they live in a residence that allows them and their household to isolate safely away from others, ensuring that they have good phone and internet access, that they can use their own transport to safely access a testing centre when testing is required, uh, that they would that they are happy and comfortable in, uh, to isolate at home, and that they've got all the supplies that they need, for example, masks, food, cleaning products and so on. The planning for this approach has been underway for some time and is a key part of managing COVID-19 
in the future. It was outlined last week by Minister, Health Minister Andrew Little, and this is a key objective of our ongoing approach across the health system to better manage COVID-19 cases in the community safely. And finally, yesterday I was asked about the number of people who are pregnant who have been hospitalised during the current outbreak. Based on the latest data we have, there have been five cases recorded where those people have been pregnant and they have been hospitalised as part of this outbreak. You may recall last month in mid-September, while noting the good work done by midwives in Auckland during Alert Level 4, we noted that we had seen unvac unvaccinated pregnant people arriving in hospital and quite unwell because of the virus. So I would like to reiterate that there is now very clear evidence from experience globally, indeed our experience here, that vaccination is not just safe but is highly protective for pregnant people and there are no additional safety concerns in pregnancy. Vaccination at any time in pregnancy helps and so I would encourage anyone who is pregnant to talk to their health professional about getting vaccinated if you haven't already. Back to you Prime Minister. Thank you, Dr. Bloomfield. Look, before I hand over to Minister Hienare, which will, where he'll share some reflections on our Māori vaccination campaign, a couple of comments on today's cases. I know the highs and lows of cases is incredibly hard on people, particularly those in Tamaki Makoto. But I just wanted to reinforce again that we're not powerless. We do have the ability to keep uh, help keep cases as low as we can. Now, we spent a bit of time talking about that yesterday, but just a reminder again, the cases that we're seeing in Auckland right now are not confined to one part of Auckland. They are across 124 suburbs. I say that only to remind everyone that the rules matter for everyone, and our ask of testing if you are symptomatic applies to everyone. In fact, this morning in our briefing, a particular focus from our public health team on the fact that they have a uh, positivity rate, so the amount of testing relative to the number of positives coming back that is of concern to them on the North Shore. So if you are on the North Shore experiencing any symptoms, even if you have been vaccinated, please do go and get a test. And to everyone, please remember, this outbreak is not in one part of Auckland. I think the second interesting observation is that the highest number of cases today are across the three age ranges that are our least vaccinated, and that's the 39 years and under, keeping in mind, of course, for the 12 years and under, they're unable to be. We need everyone who can be to be vaccinated. If you are young, you are sadly not invincible. 12 of our current hospitalizations are under 39 years of age. We all have a part to play. So there are two things I ask of all Aucklanders again. One, please do get vaccinated. There are 158,522 eligible Aucklanders who have not had a first dose of the vaccine. It is within this group that virus uh, has the potential to spread and who we really need to ensure are vaccinated so that we can ease restrictions with low case numbers. Today I'm also urging all those eligible to get their second dose to bring that forward and get it as soon as possible. If you had your first dose more than three weeks ago, you can now get your second. The quicker we can get people fully vaccinated, the greater the community protection we have against the virus. So if you're watching this at home now, make a plan to get vaccinated this afternoon. There are plenty of walk up and drive through options across Auckland. Go to covid19.govt.nz. Finally, I will again just reiterate that call for everyone, please, to still stick with those rules. At the beginning of this outbreak, we used to use the phrase, stay home, save lives, to describe what was needed. And that still remains the case. I know it's hard, but we are so, so close. And we know that vaccinations are already making a significant difference to the outbreak in Auckland. But so too are people following the rules. Yesterday, Cabinet decided not to move Auckland back into level four as a circuit breaker. And that's because we have the ability with the restrictions we have now to keep making a difference. And again, we have unfortunately continued to see cases reported today that have come from non-compliance of level three. Staying home, limiting contact, only catching up with people outside in groups of 10 and getting vaccinated are all actions we can take to stop the virus from spreading. None of us are powerless. I'll now hand over to Minister Hienare to address the Māori vaccination efforts. Look, we'll then open up for questions across any uh, anyone on the podium um, today. Minister Hienare. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Tēnā tātou katoa. First, can I thank all Māori providers, uh, iwi hapu practitioners, vaccinators and staff in our DHVs that have worked tirelessly over the past 18 months on the COVID response and now as part of the efforts to vaccinate our whānau. Your efforts are indeed seen. In the two weeks prior to Super Saturday, I've travelled to a number of DHBs to better understand the challenges and successes in the vaccine rollout to Māori. I saw some great work, but I identified a number of challenges. We know too that primary care is critical for our whānau, to our GPs, pharmacists, practice nurses and practice support staff that are already on board, thank you so much for your help. For those that aren't on board, can I ask for your help too? Our whānau need you, and for many of them, you are the trusted person that will be key to them making an informed decision about the vaccination. Significant funding has already been provided to Hauora Māori to support and build capability for the vaccine programme. Our communities are going the extra mile to support one another to get vaccinated. And I know on Labour Day in counties Manuko, Heroes in the Street campaign is happening. Our Māori GPs, nurses and community leaders are going street to street on buses to engage and kōrero with whānau to encourage vaccinations. If you need support to make your decision, get your information from official sources, or you can speak to one of our kaumātua and kuia who are currently leading vaccination rates amongst Māori communities. As a government, we will be making further announcements to support the Māori vaccination effort later this week. We've seen the threat to this current COVID, uh, we've seen the threat that this current COVID-19 outbreak is to the well-being of Māori communities, with a total of 560 Māori cases recorded. In the last two weeks, Māori have made up 45.7% of total cases versus 28% throughout the entire outbreak. Although sobering, these numbers reinforce why vaccinating our communities is so important. Nō reira ki te iwi Māori, kei runga te matu Kei runga te mate uru tā i te mahau o tō whare. Kaua e tukuna kia uru mai. Ko te ārai motu hake, ko te kano ārai mate. So I say to the Māori people, COVID-19 is on the doorstep of your houses. Do not let it enter. And the best course of protection still remains for us to vaccinate our people. Thank you, Prime Minister. Oh, kia ora, Minister Hinare. We'll open up for questions. I'll start with Gina. Yep, then to one and we'll come across um, to Jason. One of the, one of the reasons that you've, um, you've said in the past that you don't want to set a target or a goal for vaccinations is that it doesn't take into account the likes of Māori populations, a blanket target doesn't address that. In that vein, will the, um, the goal that you announced on Friday take Māori vaccination rates mm. into account? Will there be a specific target that you need to hit in the Māori population? We've always been concerned about ever creating a space where anyone interprets that there's room for people to be left behind. And so, uh, yes, we've been thinking about that and the work that we're doing, which we'll be sharing a bit more detail around on Friday. But what I would say is that the work that's going on right now with our Māori providers and that we need to make sure that we are providing all the resource required is critical. And regardless, that needs to continue until we reach everyone. You know, even when you talk about vaccination milestones, that will never be the end of our vaccination campaign. Uh, I will not stop until I've had a conversation or know that we are reaching out to as many people as possible and ensuring they know why it is so important to be vaccinated. Would you be comfortable with any easing of restrictions before Māori reach 90% double dosed? Well, we've made it clear that the restrictions in particular in Tāmaki Makaurau, my own electorate, are there for a reason, and that's to protect other communities, which is why, as the Prime Minister has uh, already mentioned, vaccination is key, not just for the Māori population in Tāmaki Makaurau, but everywhere else. As I went around the country, uh, uh, some communities acknowledged that COVID-19 hasn't been there, and there seemed to be some form of apathy towards it. Um, but I, as I said in my comments, uh, COVID-19 is on the doorsteps of our houses, so I need to make sure that we can continue to drive up vaccination rates. And I'm sure, Minister, whilst we're not going to make announcements about Friday, but what we're already seeing is that it's now not just... I don't think it's fair to say that we've got this blanket unvaccinated uh, uh, group. Actually, we have a group of particularly young people. 
So our rates for our older Māori are high. We're now really narrowing and honing in on our young people and certain parts of the country. We're at roughly 72 in Tamaki Makoto first dose. There are young people in other parts of Aotearoa that we really need to focus in on who don't think it is real or that it affects them yet. But it, but as you said, it, it does affect them. So yes. will, will you give a commitment to Māori that you won't move, that you won't... We'll be talking in more detail about these issues on Friday. Yeah. yeah. Minister Hinata, you referred to people who aren't on board within some of our community leaders. Who were you referring to? Who's not on board in getting those Māori vaccination rates up? Uh, so I was referring directly to a number of PHOs and GP clinics that I met with personally as I went around the country. They've made it clear that their focus is on uh, uh, those on their books and that they'll continue to provide the normal health care that they would. They are, of course, though, monitoring uh, the situation with respect to the vaccine numbers, and I implore them to continue to help us drive up those vaccination numbers. And your focus isn't on vaccines, it's just doing their day-to-day -day job, and you're calling on them to really step that up. I am, but I will acknowledge that a number that I did meet with are also still involved in the vaccination process and heavily involved, and I acknowledge that too. Are you said, yeah, Jason. Well, there, um, in your opening comments, you said, you said that we've seen a number of cases coming today from non-compliance. We're seeing the highest daily count that we've seen to date. How many of today's cases are actually from, can you give a figure, of people that have been non-compliant? No, I can't necessarily break it down. I can tell you that 39 of our cases today are household or contacts of existing cases. So you'd expect that relative proportion. We do know that some of the cases we have today are from social gatherings. And as I've already said, uh, from some of the analysis that our teams on the ground have done in the past, they've identified that one of the uh, significant contributing factors are those social indoor gatherings. Is this today the peak, or can we expect to see COVID cases at triple digits? Of course, what we continue to look at is the overall trend from what we're seeing from cases. They're continuing to tell us that we've got a R value of between 1.2 and 1.3. And so just to give some clarification, a, a reproductive value of that rate will see cases continue to rise. The best way that we can get in front of that is by following that, those rules that we have because they set out how we can stop ongoing transmission, but also being vaccinated. There is already a view that vaccination is making a strong difference to this outbreak, but I don't want people relying on it at this stage. The rules also need to be followed. Um, jo, Derek, and then I'll come back to Amelia. Um, Minister Hinata, you said in your opening comments that when you travelled around the DHB, some you saw some great work, but you identified challenges and other. Can you elaborate on that for me, please? Um, which DHBs are having challenges? What are those challenges, and what is being done to overcome them? Uh, so some of those challenges uh, are around the funding distribution and the speed at which that's been put out into those community providers and those Māori health providers. Uh, I've also uh, noticed a lack of strong leadership amongst the community and cl including the DHB with respect to what's required for the vaccine rollout. Uh, those are but two of the challenges that I noticed and I'll give the example. In Taranaki, for example, we heard from Māori health providers and iwi uh, that they were dissatisfied with the job that the DHB was doing. Uh, we met with the DHB and have now, can now confirm that 16 hapu and the DHB are working together to continue to roll out the vaccine amongst that community. Only two hapu have decided not to be involved in that, but the door will continue to be open to them. You were no stranger to the fact that DHBs have been slow at delivering. You and uh, Andrew Little are doing a massive reform because of that. Given how late we are into the vaccination rollout now, that money was available for Māori health providers back in end of February, March this year, and you're having these conversations now. Have Māori been let down by the failure of DHBs to do their job and pass on that funding? Uh, the first thing I'll say is that the first announcement at the beginning of the year was direct funding from the Ministry of Health to Māori health providers. It sidestepped the DHB. As the programme continued to roll out and the, and the DHBs play a critical role in the region, to secure the vaccine and to deliver the vaccine to our providers in the community. We did put the second lot of funding through the DHBs and that has proven problematic. Mm. And I just ask Dr Bloom to, for your position on this too, you're obviously the Director General of Health. Are you happy with the way that the role that DHBs have played? Um, the Minister has just said there that there is not leadership within some of them. Is that good enough? Uh, overall, I'm very happy with the role DHBs have, have played, and I think what we've seen here, and the Minister was referring to this, is there is variability across the DHBs. Some of them have had, had 
built on existing outstanding relationships and partnerships and got some very good results. We can see uh, across some of the DHBs very high, uh, well across all DHBs, high coverage of our Komatua, which is excellent, uh, and variation in coverage across DHBs very much related to the strength of the relationships and the speed with which they're able to provide resources out. The, what we're doing now is, of course, is addressing where, where that performance is not as good as it should be. We're going in to support the DHBs and the local providers. Do you think that's going to be too much? I don't think so. No. You, you know, but you've got communities who have been let down by the failure of DHBs, and we're now at a point where it's nearly November, and you're only identifying where the failures are in those DHBs. I don't think that's, I don't think that's fair at all. You know, we've been talking for some time about the need to make sure that we had have good coverage of our vaccinations across the board. $87 million has gone roughly into specifically targeting a vaccination program that is reaching into Māori communities. We've had similar initiatives with our Pacifica communities. We need to do the same with other ethnic groups who may not be, uh, we may not have reached into as much as we would have hoped by this stage. I don't think it's fair to say that we have not focused on this issue or indeed that DHBs haven't been doing work. But we're now drilling into some, as the Minister have said, we are now drilling into some very specific, in some case, relationship issues that exist, identifying what exactly is happening in those relationship issues, where it's breaking down, and how we can help. Yeah. The Minister has identified now, in October, going around the DHBs, that there are still issues. My point is, is that we've had the rollout for some time. Māori have been behind from the outset. Why is this problem only being fixed now? And, and Māori should feel let down by the I system. Disagree with, I disagree with that. I mean, obviously, every, every point in the vaccination campaign, we've been trying to ensure that we have an equitable rollout. And of course, as you see those results coming through, we can see where those areas need to be more highly targeted. Um, but again, it's not across the board. In some areas, we've seen fantastic rates and fantastic programs, even in some communities. So I wouldn't want to cast just this generalisation across everywhere. But yes, in some areas, we do need to be, be doing better, absolutely. We want to identify where those are issues with driving demand, where it's relationship issues, where we need to better support providers. But those are conversations that didn't just start in October. Mr. Oh, yeah, sorry. I will come to Māori TV if I can before I come back across. And then... Mena i arawatu te kāwanatanga ki tō rātou rautaki ka eke atu tewe Māori ki te iwa te kau ōrau no ngarangi whakatākua pahure a ke hea He mā mā noa te ki a we nā momo kōrero ki a tātou i tēnei wātonu i ki te atua hau i tā rātou mahere he mea rereke te tukuna atu i te kano mate ārai i te tīmatanga o te tau ki te mea ka kitea nei e tātou i tēnei wātonu no reira ko tāku e mea tuana kā rea ue whakai Waru marama, ana ko eke atu, kaore anau te Māori ka eke atu ki te rima te kau ōrau. Ka hia te roa i mua atu i tā tātou ki te, i te eke ngao o ngā kano arai mate mo te Māori ki te waru te kau iwa te kau ōrau rānei. Koe nga te ki a te primia, ka ahua rereke ki roto i ngā takiwa. Ko ki te atu i etahi e piki haere atu ana, ko etahi e tōmuri haere ana. Ano reira ko tāku e mea atu ana, ka ki te atu i tātou katoa ki roto o tāmaki makaurau e piki haere nei, ka tata atu ki te waru te kau pai heneti. Engari ki roto i wahi ke atu pera i te tairawhiti, kā re kore kei te tōmuri haere. Engari koe nga te ki a te primia ki a kau a tātou e tukuna atu i ngā heki katoa ki roto i te pā ke te kotahi. Nō reira ki roto i ngā wiki me ngā marama e tūnei ka whakatika aina. Ki e tahi mātanga haura Māori i ngā hui kua pahurea kei ngā rangi whakata. Ko tā rātou e ki ana, ko tā te kāwanatanga, he kōrero noa ki a rātou, e harai te mea ka noho ka wānanga mo te anga whakamua mo tēnei rautaki. Hea tō whakauti ki tērā. A kāre au e whakai ana ki tērā kōrero mai i te tīmatanga o te tau nei i noho tahi a hau o tira e tahi o mātou ngā minita ki ngā rato ngā hau ora Māori ki te āta kōrero i ngā take e pāna ki te tuku i te kano mā te ārai nei. Nō reira kāre au e whakai. Uh, when retail and hospo are allowed to reopen, will they be required to shut down for 14 days if a staff member tests positive? Uh, that all comes down to the new public health guidance that will accompany uh, our expectations around that new framework, and those are some of the details that we'll speak to on Friday. And is there any detail to give on sort of what support might be put in place when a case is linked to a business? Uh, again, economic supports that will accompany that new framework. We'll be going over some of the detail of that on Friday. As you can expect, you know, as you enter into a new highly vaccinated environment, 
uh, there will be ways that we can alter up the way that we deal with cases and contacts of cases, um, because risk uh, and the risk of those for those vaccinated individuals or those around them can reduce. So we need to build that into the way that we work with contacts. Prime Minister, Prime Minister. Uh, yeah, I'll come here and then into the front with Derek. Uh, between Kinnati, the two is, it, is it good enough that community leaders in Tairawhiti felt the need to fundraise for that vaccine? Clinic, that mobile uh, look, uh, I don't think so at all, and both the Prime Minister and I have already expressed our frustration about this, but can already tell you that the work's being done to solve this particular problem and it's being expedited. So you've spoken to those who've organised it? Uh, I've definitely spoken to the Māori health providers and to the DHB. Uh, my expectation, and it was my direction, in fact, that they all sit down and work this out together. I can also say that uh, despite the fundraising efforts, there have already been three mobile clinics that have mm -hmm. gone through to Tairawhiti, and ongoing work is needed to provide support for our Māori health providers. I visited one of them when I was in Ruatoria. There was a TPK camper van that was moving around the area at that time, and of course it has been more confined to Gisborne, but there's also a bus that's been used and two horse floats that have been refitted and used on the coast as well. Obviously, though, there's been an identified gap that should be filled, and as the Minister has said, he set out an expectation uh, that that be worked through and resolved as soon as possible. Prime Minister, uh, I did say coming to Derek. Did you identify gap raised with your minister when you were in Tairawhiti last year? Pardon, sir? Was that identified gap raised with you when you were in Tairawhiti last year? No, sadly, and that was part of my frustration. I sat with Māori health providers uh, on the Thursday and I asked what further tools do they need to be uh, fully participating in Super Saturday and nobody mentioned anything about a mobile clinic. I talked about the, that those communities are best placed to yep. have the role, that action the role that for their own communities. Yep. Why then was that second tranche of targeted funding directed through the DHBs? Why wasn't it not done with the same as the first tranche and provided to Māori Health providers directly? So it was provided to the DHBs on the discussions that we had with Māori Health providers. At the time, it was felt that where most hadn't yet quite spent the money that had been delivered in the first tranche, the second tranche was to go to the DHB to be able to facilitate the equity plan with those Māori health providers, and we had all agreed on that, which is why it was done that way. Minister, in addition, there has been... Issues, though, with the DHB communications, which you also spoke about yesterday. Yeah. Should it not have just simply gone to the, directly to the, to the Māori health providers? In the first well, it's once again to the Prime Minister's point about the inconsistencies across a number of those DHBs. A number of them are doing absolutely fantastic, and the mm. money's out the door quite quickly, but in other cases it isn't, and that's the problem we're going to be fixing. I think we do, if I could, just for a moment, raise it I mean, the Minister is absolutely right. You know, I would hate for this conversation to lead anyone with the impression that actually we have, that we somehow don't have the same goal. Everyone does. The DHBs, the Māori providers, those providers who actually sit outside of health but are helping to drive demand to vaccination centres because not everyone involved here is a Māori health provider. It's often iwi and hapu involved there too. Everyone has the same goal. But this is actually really hard work now because now we are actually needing to go out and street by street, town by town, have direct conversations. That takes a, a lot of resource. And the question is, how do we get that to people more effectively, if there are barriers, how do we get over that? How do we make sure there's nothing standing in anyone who wants to help's way of lifting those rates? One of those providers provided a plan to DHBs and the Ministry to do that in February, including via a vaccination bus. Why was that rejected? Uh, because on balance, as we look towards the rollout of the vaccine as it stood back in February, it was our belief that we were able to do that better. And what I mean by that is, of course, the cool store requirements for yeah. the vaccine were very different back at the time that mm. that particular application was received to what we now know. We at that time were having to centrally, we had, we had supply con in a constrained way, so we were having to make sure that we were managing the distribution. Right. Now, of course, you can see buses and things, mobile units being used often. Yeah. And some funding has gone directly to TPK to enable distribution through final order as well. The median Māori age is 26, mm -hmm. but age group under 30 were only eligible in the rollout to first have a first dose from September the 1st. Except with the whānau based approach that we well, took. Do you think that that... Not that you're going to skim over that, eh, Derek? Well, obviously there's, you know, people who are immunocompromised with other group 3, but in general, those from under 30 could only get that dose, first dose from September 1st. Do you think that was a mistake? Uh, no, I don't think it was, because what we also know is that Māori health providers were clear for the first half of mm. this year that they didn't have the infrastructure to be able to deliver 
on the kind of scale that we required them to, which is why we did the sequence plan like we did. So no, I, I don't agree with that. But also remembering we had constrained supply at that point, so the message we were sending was actually, if you have whānau who come in supporting someone who is eligible, do the whole whānau. Actually, if you're going into a rural or isolated community and you're setting up a centre to bring in Komato and Kuia at Marae, do the whole whānau, do everyone at the same time. So we did give that flexibility. So I think, unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily get captured by the age bands. Early on with that constrained supply, 40,000 doses were specifically distributed for that for those purposes. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to just bounce around here. I'll come back to Mark and then to you in the centre, yeah. Last week, Minister Robertson said he, uh, he was asked about whether the public health advice that Dr. Bloomfield has given over the course of the outbreak could be released and expedited. He said he would take that to you. Has he mentioned that to you? And then what's the progress on, on that? Oh, can I go away and check, Mark? But again, anyone who wishes to ask for any differences between cabinet decisions and public health advice, you're obviously always free to do that here, and we open, openly answer those questions. The rest goes through the usual OAA process, um, but I can check in on scheduled release date. But if anyone wishes to ask any questions on those decisions yesterday, um, in advance of that release, you should feel free to do so. The, 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 the general uh, proactive release policy that Cabinet adopted uh, back in 2018 says within 30 business days of a document going to Cabinet, it should be proactively released. That means we should be seeing some of these documents from the first Happy to go back and check on that. But again, I doubt there will be anything particularly in there that will surprise you because we very openly share any potential differences in advice received and uh, what we um, decide. The only thing I would say is because we base it on the information that we even receive in cases that morning, sometimes the public health advice will be written 24 hours or even 48 hours prior so sometimes the verbal advice from the Director General can differ a little bit from what's contained in the Cabinet paper. Uh, yes, I did say I'd come to you. Thank you. Um, just back to Māori vaccination rates. Yeah. Um, so Fado Order have said today they've hit half a million doses, but they've also said had they been allowed to deploy vaccination in line with the February business case, um, that Māori would be over 90% vaccinated by now. What's your response to this? And do you wish you'd moved sooner? So the one thing on I would just, we just need to remember is that when we started our rollout, we had really constrained supply. We did not have, obviously, the ability to do what we're doing now with large numbers of doses distributed across the country. And the strong public health advice was we needed to focus in on those who were confronting COVID at the border, um, those who had comorbidities, those who were in our older age brackets, and of course, we also prioritised counties Monaco. Mm. So that was, and a whānau-based approach, we docked in there as well. Um, that was because we had the limited supply that we had. And so that was the basis on those decisions. But I do think it's important to remember in February, we did have very limited supply, but that didn't stop us trying to reach those who were at the greatest risk of COVID at that time. Um, anything further on that, Minister Kennedy? Uh, no. Yeah. So, so Prime Minister, Prime Minister, Minister why oh, did... But I'll come to Ben and then Bernard, yeah. How many of today's 94 cases are Mali? So the breakdown uh, that we have at the moment, so at the moment we're sitting at 30 of today's cases reported in the last 24 hours, 39.4% Māori, 36.2% European or other, 4.3% uh, Asian, 14.9% Pacific. Thank you, Prime Minister. Given uh -huh. the um, delays to Māori being vaccinated or the lower prioritisation, as Derek said, given the transition from elimination at a time when... I reject the idea of lower prioritisation. I really do. Well, I mean, okay. Given the under-representation of Māori in yeah. vaccination rates currently, uh, given the over-representation of Māori in the outbreak, do you believe the government's response breaches the Treaty of Waitangi? No. Um, and also keep in mind that the profile of this outbreak has moved dramatically. In the beginning, it was well over 60, sometimes 70% were Pacifica. So huge rates, rates there. Um, and of course, you'll know that the approach that we've taken in our rollout, what we probably need to keep doing is look across at some of the Pacifica rollout and what can we can make sure that we keep learning across the country with that rollout because those numbers have been in some areas really exceptional. So it's, it's obviously been a changeable outbreak and there's been differences in our vaccine um, take up across different populations. That question to, to the Minister Hannah. Of course. Do, do you believe the government's response is in keeping with its obligations under the treaty? Look, and I've been quite clear, and we have been from the start, and you'll see it in all the cabinet decisions that were made, was that we kept Te Tiriti or Waitangi mm. at the forefront of the way that we made our decisions, and I'm quite comfortable with that. 
And, and we're talking almost as if the vaccine campaign is done. It is not. We are still vaccinating, and we are still working very hard to vaccinate everyone that we can um, and to provide answers to questions that people have, make sure that we've got community providers who are trusted working on this campaign. And the thing that we've constantly said is that we actually support any innovation because we know that community are best placed to do it. question about vaccination and more a question about Māori involvement in decision making. Ah, OK, well, I still stand by my answers. OK, Prime Minister, Bernard. Prime Minister, if, if the supplies were short in February and March, why didn't you agree to prioritise Māori, as many Māori health practitioners um, propose? And is that the reason why, it's, why so many Māori groups are so far behind now? Well, I, I guess I would question what, what evidence you're using to suggest that amongst those categories that we weren't, because alongside also saying we want to make sure that we're reaching our older Māori community members and our older Pacifica community members and those who work at the border or have comorbidities, we were also putting specific funding in to try and support that as well. But it meant that young Māori weren't prioritised. It does mean that we followed an age-based approach, except where we said, of course, we wanted a whānau-based approach. So we wanted, of course, Māori providers to have flexibility. So uh, no other provider had that flexibility, but they did. Just on Murapapa. Um, yeah, and then I'll, I will just try and keep the time, because I know you've got question time, Mum, that you want to do. Just so, on Murapapa, um, there's a kaumātu there, Pem Bird, who's saying he doesn't want that community to um, be vaccinated with Pfizer. He wants to wait for something else and he won't be told what to do. What's your view? Well, obviously he's already said what he's going to do with my view. But I was in Murupara recently. Um, they had uh, one, of their, one of their highest vaccination days. I see that since being beaten with Super Saturday. And so, uh, you know, Fano, there are turning out to be vaccinated. And I would say that actually Pfizer is... Uh, uh, one of the safest, most effective vaccinations that is available. We were very particular about that. Mm. So I would encourage everyone in Murupara, please be vaccinated. Um, it is safe, it is effective. Is there anything you want to add on that, Dr Bloomfield? Okay. Well, yeah, I, sorry, I, I do owe you one, and then I don't think you've had one, Thomas. And then we'll finish over in the corner. Oh, you have Time. Kohipake <laughs> Tēnoka te ngako o taku kōrero hei whaka oho oho i tewi, kua ki a tua hau ki roto i etahi o ngā takiwā kai te noho taiapa noa a tewi Māori hoi no tāku hei whaka oho oho ake, e hake i te mea hei whaka mataku, engari hei whaka oho oho ake ke. Engari ko tāku atu ki a koe mo te āhuatanga ki a tauwhi te hunga Māori kāre anō ki a whaka whiwhia ki te kanoma te ārai nei. E hara ke kei a mātou anake te huarahi kia whakarataratau mai we nei tāngata ki te rongo anei kahore. Engari kei te ringaringa o ngā hapuri, o ngā hapu me ngā iwi. Koi nga tā mātou e hiahiana, a te praere, ka whāki atu i e tahi atu kōrero. I've also got a question for Dr. Blanford. Is it acceptable for a COVID-positive person to be told they need to go to their nearest testing site and get their kids tested while they themselves have COVID? Yes, we do have people who are positive cases, in particular people who are maybe isolating at home, do go out for testing at community sites. And I understand there was a particular situation in Auckland where the communication perhaps wasn't as good as it should have been, and there were some issues with then getting the test result back, and I've asked the team to have a look into that. Should a COVID-positive person be contacted by a nurse while waiting further instructions, either to be moved or...? It depends on the circumstances, and uh, usually we would expect daily contact. Uh, there has been some delays in getting into the and transportation from home to quarantine facilities over the last couple of days because of the case numbers, and so we're looking at how we can expedite that. But I know this person has uh, has now been contacted this morning, and arrangements are being made. Pressure as, as the DHBs in Auckland facing with a growing number of cases there, and how many other DHBs from the rest of the country are having to pitch in? 
Oh, well, the, the DHBs in Auckland have got good plans in place, both in the hospital setting and, as I mentioned in my opening comments, they are now rolling out a community-based model of supporting Fano to isolate safely at home. Uh, where they need support from around the country, we do have a national process in place to be able to get staff from around New Zealand to support if they need that. But they've they've been preparing and they've got uh, they've got their plans in place. Hey, hey sorry, I'm going to just make sure I cover those here. And I had a question, yeah. and then we're going to wrap. Just a couple of quick ones, and forgive me if Jason already picked up on this, but have any of the 94 cases today been related to the connected to that? very well publicised an offshore party. I asked that question specifically because I knew someone would be interested in asking and the response I got was that was to the best of their knowledge no at this point. Dr Bloomfield, um, apparently the Ministry of Health hasn't sought legal advice over the introduction of vaccine certificates or doesn't appear to have, while other agencies have. Why hasn't the Ministry of Health um, received such legal advice for vaccine certificates? I don't believe that I would consider that necessarily an accurate question. So you're claiming that we haven't sought Crown Law support of vaccine certificate development, is that the question? I'm asking whether the Ministry of Health has sought legal advice itself. I mean, that's... Well, uh, well of course, the point is whether or not there is legal advice on the existence of vaccine certificates, regardless of which agency seeks it, I would have thought. So there, so there is, and you're satisfied that there's no rights issue at play? Uh, yes. We'll make sure that wherever we're utilising them, that we have good grounds to use them. Sorry, anything the only thing I would say is that um, there's obviously been <coughs> a lot of liaison with the Privacy Commissioner as well around the privacy aspects of the use of um, yep. vaccine cert certification, just as there has uh, right through the programme with the rollout of Book My Vaccine and various other um, elements of the programme. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, and then I'm going to finish. I just um, have a question for our, uh, an Auckland colleague. People around this time of year are usually planning for Christmas and New yep. Year's. Um, should Aucklanders be preparing for a normal Christmas or should they be preparing for one in Level 3 or with, um, that Auckland yeah. So as we said yesterday, we're really acutely aware that Aucklanders cannot continue to live week by week. Uh, and so whilst we are still finalising the detail of some of the framework that we anticipate we're moving into in a highly vaccinated environment, we've already signalled uh, that we anticipate being able to give more direction um, to Aucklanders at the end of the week. When it comes to the issue of the border, we're also doing additional work on how we can manage the competing interests of the rest of New Zealand where they predominantly do not have COVID cases, ensure their safety, but also acknowledge that Aucklanders will need to be able to move around. Follow on that on uh, no, of I do need to stick to just the plan I have here. Uh, this is for Minister Hanare. Yeah. Um, have the failings and the shortcomings that you've seen in the DHBs in particular over the course of the year as far as Māori are concerned, in your own mind, vindicated your own pr pressure to get a Māori health authority? Yes. All right, thank you very much, everyone. I already answered that question quite a bit in the morning round. Health is sitting in 10 minutes. Could we pick, I'm happy to pick it up offline, uh, Derek, no, no trouble. Um, we can follow it up.